So I'd like to actually start by talking about the difference between the two. I know it's a common thing, but just to lay the foundation, Andre, can you start us off by giving a nice definition of AR and VR and how they differ? Yeah, so um, just to, to start that off, we this is probably a really fun topic. That, that this panel in general is probably going to be pretty fun cause, for us because we talk about this stuff like constantly. It's really not down to science. This, this is a very gray area. People say AR and VR, and in semantics, we actually have this dichotomy, this idea that there's AR here and there's VR here, whereas it's much more like a grayscale. It's a gradient. There's some, you can have some AR elements inside VR, and you can actually do uh, often VR with AR headsets and technologies. And so we constantly, among us and in, in the community in general, talk about uh, what is AR, what is VR, and people completely disagree all the time about what is and isn't uh, AR and VR. And, and I think this is what this panel is basically going to be about. It's just what us uh, you know, uh, talking like we do at cafes about this specific topic. Great. So I think there's an interesting point that we're going to face where AR and VR technology will start to converge. Right? I know it's something that we all think about. And so, Ryan, what do you think is that point? What's that moment where AR and VR start to converge? And some way that I've sort of uh, thought about it in the past is like an opacity slider, right? Being able to go from full immersion all the way down to just subtle placements of digital objects in a world. What do you think that tipping point is where AR becomes VR and vice versa? So. At Meta, you know, we aren't talking officially about what we're doing in terms of this, but you know, generally speaking, I can say that I think if you just think about where we are as an industry and where we're headed and the tool sets we're using and the technologies that are present in our devices, you know, to your point, the only real difference between AR and VR when you, you know, zoom out a little bit is the sort of uh, exposure to the real world. And if you can turn that off, now all of a sudden I'm in VR, whereas I can turn back into AR, and there could be an in-between. So, you know, it's not completely unreasonable to think that there's optics that will be able to turn on and off that will allow you to switch back and forth between those. Generally, I think, you know, what you've got to consider is the significant philosophical difference between AR and VR, which is VR brings me into a different world, and AR sort of brings things into my world, uh, but still no reason that technologically they can't be the same. Cool, thank you for that. And so commercially, right? I mean, it's been really interesting being at this show and seeing the difference between the type of content that's being showcased here versus somewhere like San Francisco or Los Angeles, which is where I'm from. And it's very practical here. Everyone is really trying to tackle things that are actually going to improve performance, actually going to improve productivity, and so when you're thinking about these technologies, you know, how do you think about VR versus AR in terms of actual commercial viability, in terms of the actual use cases? I know that you've done some work with Boeing, so I'd love to hear sort of your thoughts on you know, which technology was most helpful. Okay, well, it might be slightly controversial, but in my opinion, only VR only works. That's the only one of the two that there's real world applications for. So when we work in directly with industry, we work with the aerospace uh, companies, BA Systems, Rolls-Royce, Boeing, uh, Airbus. They want that risk set of investment. They want to see where the value sits. And, and if we put AR applications in front of them, that it's sometimes, sometimes the buy-off's a little bit, a little bit ropey, that return of investment isn't necessarily there. What we're seeing with VR, I mean, VR's been around for 20, 30 years. It didn't appear in 2013 when, with the Oculus. But because VR now matches people's expectations, you put a headset on and your expectations are matched. Whereas for the previous 15 years, you, just, you, would, you were always left disappointed. I think that's the problem with AR at the minute. People experience AR and they go, oh, really? And I think with VR, it's now matching that. So those, those experiences are far easier to get into industry. Mm -hmm. um, but we've still got challenges around integration and actually how do, you, how do you create a seamless process in terms of getting data from A to B and creating some sort of visual system that ties into their existing MES, their existing CAD systems. And it's a real challenge. I mean, the, from, from an AR perspective, the, the highest TLL form of AR is projection. So we, we're using a lot of optical projection. So it's delivering UV AR experience in terms of I'm projecting information onto a part so it's contextualized, but it's not head mounted, it's not HMD. So 
Uh, um, yeah, we're gonna. Well, I think we're both gonna fight with you a little bit. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. I mean, first now of all, it's AR yeah, versus yeah, you, VR. Yeah, there you go. Now you, but you run an AR company, so uh, that's one thing. But in general, I just don't think people are disappointed by AR. It's definitely earlier. I totally agree with that. But I, I wouldn't go that people are disappointed. You know, when when you're in the real world and you manage to grab digital objects and move them around, and it's po it's well tracked and it follows the world around you. There, there's still that feeling that it's not like we're okay. We're not here to the point where it's like we're going to sell as as many units as in VR, but it's, I wouldn't use the word disappointing. I, I would just add uh, some color, which is to your point and, and somewhat contrary to your point, uh, we're early in AR and the technology has pretty much sucked uh, up until recently. Uh, and, you know, that's been the barrier. Uh, VR sucked until the DK1, and it kind of sucked even then. And the DK2, it still kind of sucked, and now it's pretty good. Uh, and the Vive is great. So, you know, it's really about the technologies getting to a point of maturity that can enable the use cases yeah. that can surpass. In the same way, I'm not going to throw my phone away for AR today. I'm not going to throw my VR device away today that works for my airplane. But the moment that I can have full immersion and I can have full opacity and I can have all the things that I want and I can overlay on top of, you know, a plane, that maybe that becomes more useful, but until that yeah. point, why abandon VR? Oh no, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying we should abandon technology. <laughs> I'm just saying that we need to be mind from from my very much industry focused perspective. We need to be real mindful that we are not pushing technology for technology's sake. We're not saying, look, this is this is the bee's knees. This is a fantastic platform. You should be using this. And then maybe the use cases are a bit woolly. Maybe the, the hardware isn't quite doing what we want to do. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not fantastic hardware. It doesn't mean when it, to, 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 to likes of us, it's fantastic. We're blown away by what it does. But what I'm saying, when we, when we try to, well, to, to quit the HoloLens, when we put people in the HoloLens, they are industry, people in industry are blown away by what it does and what it's capable of. <laughs> we find when we put people outside of that in there, they always draw on the slightly negative aspects of it. Um, which is that kind of barrier that we have to face. Yeah, yeah. tiny field of view. I, I just want to, you know, make sure you're not by yourself here. Uh, defending. <laughs> but, uh, Thank you. No, I mean, I, I think, two you know, two now. just kind of to the, to the point of the fact that there's been a lot of innovation, uh, especially in AR, but, but VR has been around for 30 years. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Time, tech, uh, you know, it's, it's not been a, it's been a kind of a labor of love for a lot of these old timers who've really been at the forefront uh, when VR first started. AR is so new, right? So I think we're all acknowledging the fact that the tech is evolving. We saw some pretty interesting things from Meta, from HoloLens, yeah. right? Um, but it's uh, industry is experts, experts say it's three to five years away still, mm -hmm. kind of from a, a more adoptive basis. And I think that doesn't mean there's going to be applications, use cases there are right now that, are, that exist and that people are using it, but it just isn't as developed, and, but it will get there. I think so. points that you guys are making that are really good that I fully agree with um, and that everyone should, should take home from here is that you don't want to push the technology too early because you'll actually hurt your client, you'll hurt yourself, and you'll hurt the industry uh, by being too early and then people just not not feeling like it's something they want to look at again for another five years. So I know there's actually a huge amount of crossover, right? Looking at VR as sort of what's consumer ready now, there's actually <laughs> really amazing key learnings that are coming from the technology today. And so I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts on what those key things are that are actually being solved by VR today in the consumer market that we can take into the AR industry and actually use that as leverage to launch AR into, and this is something we should discuss, what could potentially be a much larger industry, at least in the immediate future, than VR. So I'm curious, Chris, have you seen anything on the VR side specifically that you think is specifically applicable to AR? So I, I think it's, it's going to be different use cases, right? So um, VR has kind of been central for gaming right now. I don't think AR is going to start out that way. I mean, you, you really see that in the enterprise space part of its cost, part of its uh, just kind of the value that AR intrinsically brings. Um, so it's going to come from different directions. But you do see is the business models. I think you're going to learn some lessons from VR. Um, right now, you know, I would argue that mobile VR just doesn't make that much money out there. You have a lot more headsets, but people have been conditioned, especially with their iPhones and their Android phones, the price of content is free. It's zero. It's freemium. Right? So you're starting to see that already a lot in mobile VR. Now, will AR follow that lead, or will it look at more like the premium 
kind of PC-based VR that we have with the, with the Vive, with others, uh, the console. So, you know, I think there's definitely lessons in the business model that will we'll, we'll take hold, and you know, we can learn from for AR for sure. I, there's there's so many things I want to like dissect okay. in what you just said. <laughs> yeah. Um, the freemium model, specifically for mobile VR, which is a tiny bubble part of what you said. That's totally true that right now there isn't uh, money being made on that front, but it's because you need a critical mass to be able to have that. Like, freemium takes volume of people. It's, it, the entire premise is have, going out to, to dozens or hundreds of millions of people and then monetizing on a very small subset of that, uh, which isn't possible with VR yet just because of the adoption. But that doesn't mean, I think, that freemium on mobile VR won't work. But to come back to the actual questions, sorry about that. Um, you know, long, very long term, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality are kind of cousins, and they kind of you could, you could have ultimately have if you know you could make it as small and as performant as uh, with limitlessly. Um, you could have an AR VR headset that could do both. You could have a headset that could like shut out the the rest of the world and then or shut out the very small part and then put digital objects as part of the actual experience. But you know. Uh, ultimately, you got to reason by first principle and go back to the to the core. And the big difference between AR and VR at the at the end is that VR kind of secludes you from the world, even if it takes you to another real world, uh, a live action world, and not necessarily a digital one. Um, it separates you from the immediate surrounding. And um, if you just think that way, uh, then anything that needs to that needs to separate you from the real world makes more sense in VR, and everything that you have benefit from having the real world around you, benefit works better in AR. So for me specifically, I work uh, live like <coughs> live like as a live sports solution. It, it actually crosses over for both. So we, we work in VR today because it's more ready as a technology, but um, the s separating you from other people around you is a problem and a, it's a blessing and a curse in that people want to be like, I'm at the stadium, this is awesome, and I want to be in my living room, I don't want to you know, see my cat walk around, I want to feel the stadium. And on the other hand, other people are like, but I want to be on the couch, my friend's here, and I want to shut him out, I want to be able to enjoy the digital world while retaining my sort of home watching experience. And it works for both works super well for gaming because gaming you want to be in it and for a lot of the other entertainments you still want to retain your immediate environment. After that in work applications in general and AR you you kind of AR can replace your cell phone really well but I think you're probably going to hit on that a lot. Sure. Uh, these are all great ideas. I, I will say you know to answer your question more specifically Tilt Brush is a, a great example of an application that I love on the Vive. Uh, and use a lot um, more than anything else and it's really useful and for me it's a tool not a toy I draw interfaces and mock them up I was so enthused by it that we built our own painting application in the real world um, and it's so much more useful in the real world than it is uh, in VR for me obviously because I'm in AR um, I think it depends on who you are if you're an artist and you want to be transported to another world and create something without any distraction it makes a lot of sense if you're a designer and I'm a designer and we're working together and we both wear glasses and we can collaborate bam of course you want to do it in AR and it makes more sense in AR so I think that's the key to underscore in terms of difference aside from yes I'm closed off or I'm in the world uh, is collaboration you know, you can do it in VR, but you lose the human element of it, and that's really important. You know, I'm a technologist. I love technology, but I hate what is happening to our world right now. Even looking around here, how many of you are looking down at your phones right now? That sucks. That's not a human form of communication. That's us conforming to a machine. I want something that works as a natural extension of me that brings me more into the world. I want more eye contact, more human connection, and that's why, personally, I have passion for the AR side of things. Uh, and I really do see these as complementary. We can disagree on a couple things up here, but ultimately, AR wouldn't be where it is without VR, and I think we're going to propel each other forward, and we're not going to uh, com you know, disappear and, and have things fade away. You're going to continue to have distinct AR and VR experiences for a long time to come. So the fact that there is a natural feed from VR into AR um, is, is, is fantastic for AR, because without historical 30 years previously for, v for VR, 
the research has been done, the value has been done. So there, there's paperwork, academic studies, there's research that explicitly states the value in terms of um, you know, accelerated learning processes by doing by learning the old uh, learning triangle, that knowledge retention rates, um, as we mentioned, the, the ability to remote support. VR always had an issue in that it was just so expensive. It was always a huge capex figure to get into that game. Now that figure is nothing. It's a material cost. It's a consumable cost. It's, it's nothing. So all of a sudden we've, we've got that empirical evidence that we can bring through to say, look, this is the value. This is the value we've got. So we're saying training. We're saying we're de-risking. So maybe, I mean, again, from an industrial point of view, we've done... We've, not only do we work in aerospace, we do a lot of work with civil nuclear, with oil and gas. So these kind of um, low volume, high value industries, uh, there's huge value in terms of trying to de-risk a lot of their engagement in terms of assembly processes. Um, and when we take that through into AR, we're looking at the removal of the non-value added tasks. So that's the removal of things like uh, sign-off, certification, um, just simply having a video camera that sits in your peripheral so that somebody can remote in and go, yeah, you've done your job correctly, I can sign that off, go on to your next step. Um, and the acceleration of those value added tasks, so it's that procedural uh, task instructions, do this, do that, have you followed the right steps? Um, so that's really in terms of how I, how I see VR and AR moving through. I want, I want to find them two seconds. So you, you sneaked in there something that, that is generally thought and accepted, which is like AR is like social because you have your friends in there and VR isn't. And it's kind of this sort of like colloquial idea, and I know you sneaked it in there. <laughs> Because you're on the AR camp, so I'm going to defend the VR camp. Um, I do love VR. I have I'm all sure of them, do, and I use but, them a lot. But I want to I want to refute that, and yeah. he's going to be on my side here. There's tons of actual. Even though it secludes you from the world, VR can actually bring other people to the other worlds you go into. So this sort of like idea that VR isn't social is you can design purely social apps. There's Tiltbrush, the app that you use, I think has released or is they releasing. Just yeah. Yeah. yeah, just released a social version where you guys can sort of paint in 3D space, but with each other, which, I mean, I, I, if you can paint with somebody that's halfway across the world and feel like you're next to each other, that's, you know, that's ultimately becomes a, a super strong feature. And I'm working on a purely social VR app right now, and I'm sure you know like half a dozen of them. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, so this, it's the same thing with the phones, right? So phones, we're all looking at our phones right now, especially those who are still doing that, which is fine. Um, <laughs> but you're connecting with somebody, most likely, unless you're surfing some inappropriate sites. But you know, you're connecting with other people, right, to bring you together. And and you put four teenagers together. What are they doing in the same room? They're just on their phones. So social is exists in both places. Yeah. Absolutely, and, and it's it's different, right? It's different in, in yeah. both. I mean, one is is sort of uh, a proxy of me, and one is me, and there's use cases for both. When I'm gaming online, I don't necessarily want people to see me in my underwear. But when I'm you know, working on something, I do want that. I want the, the nonverbal communication. And that's lost in VR in certain use cases. And that's when it makes sense for AR. But I totally I'll, I'll give you I'll give you nonverbal communication, face cues, and stuff like and body stuff. But it still feels like somebody else is in there with you. <laughs> like, just when you have positional audio and somebody, like, you, you turn your head and they're... So we're super good at being able to tell where a sound comes from. That's a huge part of social in VR. And feeling like somebody is, like, behind you or six feet to your right, six feet to your left, and you turn your head and it, then <laughs> if you turn your head and suddenly you see, hear the sound behind you, that, that the fact that you know that somebody has position in space in the world that you're in, even if they don't have, you do lose a little bit from the facial and body cues, it still feels like somebody is there with you, even without that. And that's, ultimately, it, it's, it's almost, as, it's 95% of the way to actually having somebody in the room with you, if done correctly. We have, so one of our industrial partners, um, uh, Rolls-Royce to name them, um, they have seven VR centers across the world. They signed off um, the capital expenditure for those centers on the basis that they could do remote collaboration. So they could load a drawing up and they could access that one, that one central drawing, that one central environment from disparate places across the world and they signed off a good five million pound investment based on that purely alone. Yeah, there's one, uh, one really awesome example to actually illustrate the power of VR socially, bringing in nonverbal communication. I was talking, this is like probably over a year ago, with one of the executives at Oculus who was saying that they were playing around with the Oculus toy box demo. Mm. And it was them and six of their colleagues that were in there with no audio. 
and he could actually point out who every single person was based on the way that their arms were moving, based on the way that their head was moving, and with full accuracy could tell you who every single person was. So that was just a phenomenal example of the fact that you really actually do have nonverbal communication. Yeah, you don't see every single facial movement, although people are actually working on that with tremendous accuracy right now. But one thing I know that we're probably getting close to time would be just thinking about this future of this technology being integrated into our lives, the same way that we're all addicted to this device, right? I think, you know, we're going to get to a point in history where we look at this thing and we're shocked by the fact that we used to interact with data on this tiny little device and that we would actually work on this thing for hours, with right? Thumbs. With our thumbs instead of reaching out and grabbing our data. And I would just be really curious to hear, I guess actually probably starting with you, Ryan, you know, what the, the world will look like in 20 years or in 30 years. We'll wake up and, you know, what will we do? What percentage of our world will be virtual? What percentage of our world will be based in base reality? Yeah. And sort a, of how do we interact with that? It's a really good question. And, you know, this is, this is an area where it could go really wrong and create <laughs> hyper-reality if you've seen that video. I don't want that. I, don't I think, was going to bring that up too. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody wants that. I mean, cool video, but boy, that's not what I want. Um, or maybe, you can have it on yours. But, uh, but in mine, I want uh, a natural integration. You know, we're called meta because we believe in metadata, right? So when you think about putting information on top of the world, I think the internet as it is today will exist on top of the real world. That's sort of a next generation version of that. When I wake up, you know, and I put on my device or activate my human computer brain interface, uh, you know, I'm going to see my schedule of what's going to happen that day. And I'm going to know when I need to actually wake up and where I need to go, what I need to do. And when I take my Uber, I'm going to, you know, however it launches, I'm going to launch that application and I'm going to say where I want to go. And when I get in the car, it's going to have an arrow pointing over the top of the car showing me what to get into. I'm going to pop in and I'm going to look at the window and I'm going to see an interface on the window of a map of where it's going. And, you know, if I take a subway, it's going to tell me when the train's going to come. If I go to a restaurant, it's going to show me what the food looks like and I'm going to order with it. I mean, I think every aspect of our life can be enhanced with it, but we don't want to do it just for the sake of doing it. It's got to be for the sake of improving the human interaction with the digital world. And that's the biggest challenge that as an industry we all face and we better all try really hard to do right and you know that's why we study neuroscience because we feel like that's the best path to a more natural human interface so hyper reality is that video where this it's like a supermarket this girl's like on a that's what you're talking about yes, right yes yes all right so youtube that video later hyper reality uh, and it's then do really, the opposite it's really pretty so <laughs> So what he hates about it is that that video is like too much. It's like every wall has like scrolling text and too much colors and ads <laughs> everywhere and all that stuff. But actually, so I'm going to skip a couple. Of, let's assume for a second we get it to glasses like this. Sorry to point at your face. Yeah. Um, but uh, let's assume that we can get the small glasses that are discreet and won't feel like you have this weird thing on your head. And I'm going to also jump the logic step that that I can actually do 99% of what your phone can't do and much deeper and better. But if you think about that, and, and that hyper-reality video shows it really well at one point, is that you can actually remove a lot of what is bad about the world today and just put it in the di digital world. So every billboard, every advertisement, everything that's like visual pollution in the world, when you, that's visual information so yeah billboards posters whatever can all be put every shop could be like have a digital front if people if everybody uses augmented reality you could get rid of a ton of ads in the real real world so if you took off your glasses you'd have a world that is way less visually polluted by brands and sponsors and stuff but if you want if you go by your normal day to day you would much like you do on your phone, everything would have the, the same amount of ads that we have today. And it, it's a great opportunity to get rid of the billboards, of a lot of the posters, a lot of the stuff that's actually, uh, we're used to it because we kind of accept it as a sort of necessary evil for just about everything. But it, you could have a sort of clean, very nature world versus the digital world, which is where you'd spend, or the half mixed digital world where you'd spend half of your time. And I really like that idea, that vision that like we, we could literally tune out, but tune out of an even deeper part of, of what we accept every day because we wouldn't have to deal with that uh, ad filled world just because it would mostly switch over to digital. 
It's I kind think, of fantasy, but... I think based on what you're saying, someone's going to leave here and create ad block for real life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty much... I mean, that would be tuning out. <laughs> hmm. All right. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. That was awesome. And uh, are we doing questions or... No questions? Anyone have any questions? There's some in the back. No. Yeah? Megan is bringing a microphone right around here. Oh, they bring a microphone. There we go. Um, in terms of ethics, what are the things that concern you personally most about the future of AR and VR? Privacy. Kim Jong, Kim Jong Il. <laughs> <laughs> like Kim Jong propaganda in VR. Like mm. VR is powerful, and it's just like if you like you could if you built like propaganda games, you could brainwash the hell out of somebody. I mean, you can do that with video today, and. I mean, North Korea is like a really great example of just like just normal media brainwashing the hell out of people. But if, you know, I, I'm not going to try and go too horrible in this scenario, but it's, it's like if, you know, you show, you create simulations of like, I don't know, Americans assassinating your ancestors and stuff like that. And then you push that in VR on somebody for years and years and years, you could really, really mess up that person and make them a zealot for a cause that would be ethically bad. But, I mean, at that point, you know, they do it already, so... Pr privacy. So, oh. I say, for, for me, you've got corporate ethics is a, real, is a real big challenge. So we're seeing at the minute in terms of the only way that future we're discussing can work is through interconnectivity and through open interconnectivity. So if we're starting to see silo technologies, silo organizations being unable to communicate with each other, then you're going to have kind of counter realities whereby you can only access certain information with certain devices in a certain ecosystem and other, and other applications uh, from another ecosystem. So in terms of that corporate responsibility, how the, the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks, whoever, it, whoever washes out in the next 20, 30 years, how they actually start to ethically behave together to provide us with something tangible for us, uh, that's to me is going to be the most important challenge. Privacy is uh, something I worry about a lot, and we worry about a lot, and we try to put in safeguards around that into our plans for the future. But at this stage, you know, it's, it's hard to estimate how the world will change as a result of all of us walking around with a variety of sensors on our heads that map the world. Um, I mean, we literally will have a collective map of the entire world based on the sensors on everyone's heads. So, you know, that's scary and incredible at the same time and we've got to uh, create as an industry um, expectations for privacy and not just say throw it out the window and we've got to create limitations on how that data gets used I don't know the answers but we'll figure it out yeah. do you think the rabbit's out of the hole already with that one though you gotta fight for yeah. it I know. we got time <laughs> I will. yeah so I, mean, I think it's a, it's a very valid question because uh, we, and the research is still out. It's, I think it's being done right now, but the effect of VR, AR on neuroplasticity about how behaviors can change. We talk about the good. There's always potentially the flip side. So we need to be very mindful and cognizant about that with great power that these devices and technology offers. We need to have that responsibility. And I'm not going to say regulation, but we ne definitely need to kind of be aware about that and try to see what we can put in place to prevent ethical violations. But again, the internet... I mean, look at what the internet can do. So yeah. there's a connected world right now. Bad people didn't wait for new technologies. Right. They've been bad for a long time. Yeah. Great, great panel, great questions. Uh